so without further ado, um, I'll introduce Sophia Pavel, um, who is our speaker tonight. Um, she is most well known for um, her writing, science and nature writing, um, with her debut book that um, Forget Me Not, that some of you might have heard of, that was released in 2022, that was nominated for the People's Book Prize. Um, she studied zoology at the University of Bristol and then a master's in science communication um, and now works as the communications coordinator for Beaver Trust. Um, she's also an ambassador for the Wildlife Trust and sits on the RSPB England Advisory Committee. And she's written for lots of different journals and mag magazines and newspapers even. Um, so plenty of experience and exciting things to ask about. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Maria. Hello, everyone. Lovely to see you. Thank you for choosing to spend your Tuesday evening. It's Tuesday. Um, here with us this evening. It should be nice and chilled and relaxed. And um, as Maria said, just any questions that spring to mind, um, maybe bear them in mind at the end. And I'll try and answer as many as I can. Um, but hopefully this won't be too much of a, of a waffle from me. But um, I've been asked by the guys at the BTO youth team to share a little bit about my journey to, I guess, being a science communicator, being an author, um, which still feels very strange to say, and also working directly in conservation, which is a very exciting job to be doing at the moment. It's a really exciting time and an important time, really, to be working in conservation in Britain and the British Isles and in communications. Um, so really happy to, to answer any questions about that as well. Um, but in terms of kind of how I got into it, I mean, I, uh, it, you know, being here and doing this and talking about books and writing, it was just, it's still so bizarre to me because it was never part of the plan. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was older. And I think it's taken me a long time to realize that not knowing what you want to do or who you want to be or what you want to be involved with is completely okay. And um, I put myself under enormous pressure that didn't come from my parents or friends or anyone. It was just pressure I burdened myself with. Um, I felt huge pressure to have a plan and to know exactly what I was going to end up doing. And then when things didn't work out the way I thought they would, I would get really like, oh, well, you know, I'm a failure and that's all rubbish and I'm never going to do anything interesting. Um, but that's totally not true. And um I came into this world with simply a love for mainly, first and foremost, the outdoors and adventure and being in nature. But I still don't and never did knew how to identify wildlife. I don't really know how to identify birdsong. So I didn't come into it in a naturalist way. My parents were both in the military, so they were very keen on us being adventurous and getting outside and sort of pushing ourselves physically and mentally, but not really anything more than that. There was no kind of wildlife and let's go see different species and let's learn a bit about what's here. It was more just, you know, get outside, get muddy, go camping. Um, and so I kind of sailed through school with all those kinds of interests and knew I loved animals so, so much. And I think like lots of young people just had this very like maternal paternal I just wanted to look after things and I used to play vets and all those sorts of stuff and um very much was interested like I think again many young girls especially when they have that nurturing instinct to uh, become a vet so that was always in the back of my mind um and I had guinea pigs and looked after them like they were my children and um cried over them relentlessly many times um so there was always that love of living things there and I loved reading and I didn't really listen to music but I obsessively listened to story tapes and I also kept a diary really regularly um ever since I was maybe five or six years old I always loved the idea of being a corresponder and not necessarily corresponding with anyone in particular it was often just writing to the page or to an imaginary reader, um, not even to myself. And so I used to write postcards and stuff and um, just keep a journal of, 
you know, today we did this and then I did this. And I used to sometimes write really terrible poems. But I think it was the idea of just downloading my thoughts onto the page um, that was just a habit that I didn't really reflect on how often I did that until last year when I found I moved house and I found all my old diaries. And it's like a full on bookshelf of um, the most like random thoughts of me growing up. And so I think an element of loving nature and loving storytelling and loving writing has always kind of been there, but I was never encouraged at school or I guess, you know, generally by society that actually that could be a career. You could actually get a job in those sorts of things and actually blending science and nature with the arts and with creativity and English and literature can form a really powerful channel of communication um, at a time where we really need effective communication to tell people how to take action for nature and what's going on with the environment and climate change and everything like that. Um, and so uh, the time came for me to go to university. Didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't have the right A-levels or grades to even consider veterinary medicine. But I was encouraged by my parents to just choose a degree that I enjoyed or liked the sound of. So I chose zoology, which is basically the study of the natural world and ecology and how nature interacts with the planet and the weather and with people. And so it was a very broad subject area. So there's lots of options that still remain open to you with zoology. In fact, I think I remember on like the first week of studying in Bristol, one of the lecturers was like, oh, did you know that 70% of zoology graduates in this country go on to do finance? And I was like, right, <laughs> why are we here then? Because <laughs> apparently we're good at statistics, although I'm not. So um, that wasn't, fi <laughs> finance wasn't an option. Um, but uh, yeah, so I went to do zoology and I still had in the back of my mind, oh, you know, you can transition into veterinary medicine from zoology. So that was always there. And I actually ended up doing all the work experience for veterinary medicine just in case and loved every minute of it. But what was interesting is that come second and third year zoology, where we kind of had to start thinking, OK, when we finish university, what are we going to do? Because we're not going to be in the bubble of education anymore. Um, you know, what what options are there? And in one of my veterinary medicine work experience placements, I was chatting to one of the surgeons um, in a break. And he was like, to be honest, we don't need at that time, it's say six, seven years ago now. So we don't need more clinicians. We need more researchers. We need more communicators of animal health, of conservation, of animal welfare. Um, and I was like, oh, I was like, well, that, that's a strange thing to say. Uh, I didn't know you could get a job in like animal communications. I thought communications was just like, I don't know, working for BT or helping do like human related communications. I didn't know you could talk about cool stuff like the planet. Um, and so that was like a, a sort of seed that was sown quite early on. And then I was randomly put through my course onto a field at the end of second year, they put you onto a field course. And my field course was just so happened to be public engagement with science. And I, all of my friends got randomly selected to go to the field trip in Costa Rica or Pembrokeshire or the Channel Islands or Portugal. And I was like, I have to stay in Bristol and talk to primary schools about fossils. Um, so I wasn't too enthused at the time. But actually, it ended up being one of the best things ever, because who knew that if you love science and you love your subject and you're excited about it and you can kind of feel safe to nerd out about it, how satisfying and rewarding it is to talk to other people about it and to see them feel enthused and inspired by what you're saying and, and how you're saying it and what you're telling them. And I'm naturally I've always been. When I was younger, I was so painfully shy, I wouldn't speak to anyone. I would just sort of nod and, and stare. And um, parts of, most parts of the way I work are very introverted, uh, despite what you might see on social media. Um, and so the whole writing and kind of retreating side of it really suits my personality. And so I was very surprised by how much I enjoyed science communication because it was a lot of interfacing with people. It was a lot of like putting yourself out there 
trying to challenge your confidence. Um, but it was so much fun. And so I was like, oh, okay, this is this is quite good because we have to like be creative in how we present the science to try and get children and young people really excited about it. And look, they're getting really excited about that. That's quite fun. They're asking really good questions. That's satisfying to answer. Um, and so that kind of the seed that was sown by the vet then turned into like a little sapling. I was like, okay, this kind of engagement thing is interesting. I'm going to explore that. Um, anyway, and so I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I ended up doing lo loads of work experience um, in uh, like environmental law and physiotherapy and in agricultural management. And then I was really keen on following the footsteps of my family and going into the Navy. And then I had knee surgery and then couldn't do that. Um, so it's kind of a bit all over the place, feeling a little bit lost. Um, meanwhile, it felt like everyone around me was sort of making decisions and realizing what they wanted to do. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I'm not ready for the world yet. Maybe I'll apply and do a master's and just stay in education for a bit because I didn't feel like I'd sort of found what I was good at. And I think it's really important to experiment with things to not only demonstrate what you might be good at and reveal that to you, but also to remind you of or introduce you to things that perhaps aren't well suited to you, which is almost more important to help you tick things off and say, right, that's definitely not for me, because that's really helpful, saves you a lot of time. Um, so I applied for a master's at the vet school in Bristol called Global Wildlife Health and Conservation. And I loved the sound of that course. But again, it sounded so broad. I was like, well, I might be in the same position that I'm in now where I know a lot. No, I know a little about a lot. And I can't really focus that into like a job. Um, and I accepted the master's. I got a place. I was kind of set on it. I thought, well, I'll just, you know, go with the flow. And then um, I was, I think subconsciously, I knew that there was something else out there that was probably better. And I was on my laptop late at night and I came across this master's at the University of the West of England, also in Bristol, um, called MSc in Science Communication. And I was like, huh, what is that science communication word? That sounds interesting. It kind of sounds like public engagement in science, which I really enjoyed in my second year. Um, and I looked into it and it sounded perfect. It was really vocational. So really practical, very small classes. I went from huge lecture theatres of like where you're one of 200 to 300 students and the lecture is tiny, tiny down here talking to you. And um, you feel kind of just like a number in a room. And I missed that. I, I really get a lot of learning out of a very small classroom environment. Um, and lots of feedback with the teacher. And so I loved the sound of that. And I liked the sound of the fact that you had to have a science degree to get selected for this master's. But then there were loads of really creative modules, like, um, again, public engagement in science. You could do like science shows and um, they partner with places like We the Curious in Bristol, which is an amazing science museum. Um, you could also do science on air and screen, so like radio, podcast, TV, how to translate stuff, a bit like David Attenborough stuff. That's all science communication um, and science writing as well. Um, and I liked the sound of it being really practical because then it made me confident that there would probably be a job at the end of it or that you could kind of have a bit more of an idea of what you might do after that. Um, and I liked the idea of being able to bring out creativity a bit more and for that to be really encouraged and, and celebrated as a way of um, communicating complex topics, which is what science communication is all about. Um, so anyway, I did that master's and I loved it. And I think I wouldn't be here without it. I think it was a perfect opportunity to be a good stepping stone between bachelor degree level and then um, a job. And it provided me with a kind of safe space to explore what I could do um, and then feed off other people as well in that environment um, and it's where I sort of I guess found my feet in that I realized I wanted to work in conservation and I wanted to work in communications and I liked the challenge of 
so science communication, you're essentially like a translator where you get complex science and you think, well, how can I translate this in a way that helps the public understand, you know, what they need to know from this? What are the top bits of information or conclusions or findings that are going to be relevant to them? Because people are busy, people are worried about money, people are worried about lots of things. And so what do they need to know? And how can I say it in a way that's going to help them listen, feel reassured, feel empowered and ultimately understand and form their own opinion about stuff um, without it being too sort of dry and gloomy. Um, and I enjoyed that challenge and I still do. And it's an increasing challenge, but still, you know, increasingly important to be able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I finished the master's. I'd done my research project in um, looking at how science can be communicated via social media. And at the time, which seems mad, TikTok wasn't a thing. Instagram stories weren't a thing. But Instagram was just about kicking off its exponential, like huge explosion of popularity. And so um, my research was, it feels weird to say this, but it's, it's true. It was one of the first looking at how does nature work on Instagram? And the paper ended up with my supervisor being published only because I think it was just such a new area and there was barely any research on it. You know, what do people get from it? How can we quantify engagement of nature content on these new social media platforms? So that was really an, uh, a really interesting experience. Um, and then after the master's, I had been kind of through the master's, they sort of encourage you to, to form a network and to make contacts and to do work experience and placements. Um, and so I tried really hard to maintain that network and basically lots of emailing, LinkedIn, social media, following up, um, more work experience. Um, and I moved back home to Devon and um, was experimenting with sort of freelance. I was writing for free. Um, which you kind of have to do in some cases, but I was just putting myself out there. I was building a portfolio. I was trying to do lots of different things and uh, through trial and error, figure out what worked, what didn't, what I was interested in. Um, what do people respond to? What do people not respond to? Um, I was working two retail jobs at the time just for some more steady income. And I, um, was starting to apply to lots of jobs in conservation and in communications. And if I'm brutally honest, it was very difficult. Um, it's very competitive and it was very competitive at the time. And even though on paper I had everything and more that they asked for, um, I really struggled to get the jobs that I applied for. I always got through to interview, but then it was always like, you haven't quite got enough experience. And so it was a it was a test of resilience and I think a test of passion. And if anything, from in terms of learnings, it made me feel even more determined and like actually, you know, despite being knocked down multiple times, I mean, we're talking double digits of of no's. Um, it made me still realize I really, really, really did want to work in conservation. And it's such a fascinating time to be in this industry because there's so much change in the last five years and such an urgency for people to be um, collaborating together and to be using the arts and to be finding ways to reach new audiences about important topics. Um, and then COVID came and uh I finally got a job with a new charity, which was brand new at the time. It wasn't even registered as a charity. It was with Beaver Trust, which is a charity that's putting beavers back in rivers and doing all sorts of exciting things there. Um, and they needed a comms team. And so they asked if they could take me on for a couple of weeks. And they'd seen some stuff I'd done on social media. And it was the first time that I'd been really grateful and pleased that I had persisted with putting stuff on social media as like a visual CV and a portfolio of not just my interests, but kind of maybe skill sets or collaborations I'd done in the past because they'd seen something on social media that was beaver related and were like oh we need someone who can do social media for us let's see if she's interested um so that that was a that was a good thing that happened um and I've been working for them ever since and now we're a team of 11 staff there's four people as of today in the comms team um and it's been a, a great challenge and I've been so grateful to have had that position but 
all alongside all of that, which I haven't really mentioned, um, I was writing and with no view of it being a job uh, or, you know, a little bit of a job, um, just as something I was enjoying and a bit of an escape and just a way to really practice a craft of science communication in a way that I uh, enjoyed. Um, and then ask, I was volunteering for the RSPB at the time um, in a steering group and I was asked my first ever article in a newspaper called The Metro. I was asked to write an opinion piece on the State of Nature report in 2019. And I was very confused because I didn't know why. I think I was 20, I was 24 at the time. I didn't know why a newspaper would want my opinion about that sort of subject. Um, but they did, which was a, a really good on them to give someone in their 20s the opportunity to share their thoughts about something really serious. Um, and I wrote this article and then it got picked up by a publisher and they sent me an email while I was at work in the shop. And... Um, I immediately dismissed it and said, sorry, I think you've got the wrong email. But they basically said, is this you who wrote the article? And I was like, yes. And uh, they were like, oh, have you ever considered writing a book? Because you write really differently about nature and, and we're looking for new nonfiction authors. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. And so I didn't reply for a bit. Um, and then I went back to it again and then they contacted me again. I was like, oh dear, this is like scary and terrifying. Anyway, long story short, they asked me to write a proposal for a book. And a proposal is essentially like a pitch where you have to outline all the chapters, the who, what, when, where, why, you know, the market competition, why you're the one to write this book, why now, all that sort of stuff. I had no idea what I wanted to write about, but I was like, well, you know, if if I wanted to read a book about nature, what would it, what would I want to be reading? Um, and I pitched the idea of Forget Me Not, where it's essentially a nonfiction narrative, so story. Um, that's traveling around the British Isles, that's a bit adventurous, that's a bit kind of determined and fun, but also talks about really serious, gritty stuff, but perhaps in a way that you're not expecting. So, you know, you might giggle at some bits and you might think some bits are a bit silly, but um, I think I wanted people to read a book about climate change that was joyful and that would be um, something that would uplift them, but also kind of light a fire of, okay, gosh, we need to take some action here. Um, and that publisher didn't want it in the end, which was a bit disappointing. However, um, the idea suddenly felt quite fully formed in my head. So I just went to Bloomsbury and said, hello, <laughs> this is very strange, but I've got an idea. I don't suppose if you're interested. And they were. And here we are. And so published last year It was a two year process, one year of writing and traveling during COVID, which was hard. And then another year of like editing, production, putting the book all together. And then it came out in June and then it kept me a lot busier than I expected. And I think everyone else expected. Um, and it was a fantastic, it's just been the most amazing experience. But last year, especially, was the most inspiring year for me, I guess, as a, as a newbie in this space, to be publishing a book around people like George Monbiot and Rob Farlin and just legends in this space, Amy Jane Beer, and to kind of be in the same genre as um as those sorts of authors is is really surreal. Um and so it's been a, a couple of years of juggling beavers and books, and it's still a bit of a juggling act, if I'm honest, but um it's it's been a real, a real roller coaster in the world of of conservation. So so yeah, so I'm still kind of finding my way. Um still kind of pinching myself but also like is this really is this what is this what I'm doing now is this how it is but um I'm just trying to be a bit in the moment with it and um still kind of use the old skills of you know building a portfolio being persistent and sort of tenacious with building a network and being just hopefully a nice person to work with and um enjoying uh you know, all different colleagues from amazing backgrounds and learning from as much as many people as I can. Um, so yeah, sorry, whistle stop tour of that, but really happy to answer any questions, but equally you may not have any questions and that's also fine. Thanks for listening. <laughs> wow, thank you very much, Sophie. That was, um, yeah, I couldn't even re realize, didn't even realize the time 
was going past yeah we've been talking for like 20 minutes that's great (laughs) no no that's great (laughs) please (laughs) um I've got a couple of questions from people that couldn't make it tonight that I um, mm-hmm. wanted to ask you things before. Um, but if if any of you guys um, want to pop anything in the chat, any questions, please feel free or just like pop your hand up and you can unmute yourself and we can go from there. Um, right, so I've got my list of questions from people. That's what, what should we start with? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, oh yeah, so other than your own book which I'm sure is uh, well I have read it but I, I know is a lovely book um have you got any other recommendations for um <gasps> books for young nature loving people and um it, 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 interesting things maybe a bit more out of the box outside of the box or anything oh like interesting okay let me think about this <laughs> so I always have two books on the go sometimes three which is a bit silly but I always have a fiction and a non-fiction and fiction is always by my bed because it's escapism and non-fiction is somewhere downstairs um because non- any non-fiction book now sets the cogs whirring and I just feel like I'm working even if I'm really enjoying it I'm slightly in work mode especially if it's a nature book um and when I was writing, I didn't read any nonfiction at all, which I think is probably like a massive no-no from better authors because I just didn't want to, I found it so intimidating. I didn't want to be distracted or or, or influenced or kind of swayed in any way. Um, so I just escaped into, into all sorts of fiction. But in terms of nature books, I mean, still one of the best books I've ever read, and it's not nonfiction, it's complete fiction is um where the crawdads sing by delia owens and it's got the most stunning cover of um kaya the main character in a canoe um in the swamps of the deep south of america which is where i'm from actually um and uh she is an amazing sort of fierce heroine of the story But the author, Delia Owens, is actually first and foremost a zoologist. And this is her first novel. And she came to novel writing really late in her career because she was known for writing zoological textbooks. Um, And because of that experience and that prior knowledge, the nature writing in Where the Coral Dads Sing is some of the most beautiful I've ever read. It's just, it's so, you can tell she has such an understanding of the natural world and connectivity and webs of life and ecosystems it's so effortless it's not flowery and kind of over the top and hard to chew it's just really really beautiful so if you want good escapism but also feel like you're learning something and that your brain just goes oh my gosh nature's so amazing then where the crawl dad sing is is a brilliant read also um if you want your brain to go wow uh Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake um, is very recent and very popular, but for good reason. It's just the most mind boggling exploration into the world of fungi and how much we've overlooked it and how much it underpins a crazy kind of scary amount of life on this planet. Um, What else have I read recently? Um, Oh my gosh. So I quite like the, um, so Penguin do a really good series called Green Ideas and it's their paperback and they're like this thin. So they're really easy to just whip through. Um, and it's kind of, it goes right up to modern day with Greta Thunberg's uh, book to old essays and just really interesting kind of food for thought by great thinkers in this space. And um, they're very digestible and easy to read. I read one about, a concept called deep ecology which sounds really like you know yawny and academic but um it's just this amazing philosopher I can't remember his name that's really bad I think he's called I can't remember um basically talking about life in a really deep and meaningful way but in an incredibly accessible way and he's quite witty so I enjoyed his writing because he just made it he broke up really big concepts in a very clever way um 
and I like those books because they're very easy to just chuck in a bag and and read quickly in a lunch break or on the train or on the bus or wherever um so yeah there's all sorts of good stuff I mean you know Diary of a Young Naturalist by Dara um The Flow by Amy Jane Beer all about rivers I don't think I've ever read anyone who can write about water so beautifully as Amy Jane Beer that came out last year as well um so yeah all sorts of good stuff but I have to have a good think but there's loads of non-nature non-fiction books that I learn a lot from just about the world and about how people work too and one last recommendation if you want to read a book that makes you realize how amazing people are and how amazing our species is and how much potential we have to solve all these problems that the world is is going through then um humankind and it's about like humankind uh by I think he's called Rutger. He's a Danish academic, but again, a really accessible book. It's not kind of high level at all. Um, and he basically just talks to you about the science and the psychology behind um, historical moments where humans have just done incredible things. So it's very uplifting. It's very heartwarming. And it's just a nice reminder that actually people aren't all bad and that uh it, I think it's helpful to not demonize people too much because we're the ones who can help us get out of it so that's a that's a nice uplifting one too yeah, no. sorry I could literally talk about books no, for about two hours don't worry <laughs> it's really it's really interesting and um I think probably like encouraging to people to hear that it's not just the specific nature books you should you like mm. people should be reading you should be keeping like a really broad horizon you know and looking totally. at everything yeah Otherwise, it's an echo chamber and conservation still has quite a lot of work to do to break away from the image and the reality of it being an echo chamber where everybody's kind of preaching to the converted and everyone's into it and everyone's up for it. Um, if we really, really want to get more people on board with the things that we love, we need to be really open minded too. Um, and I think reading is a great place to start for challenging your perspective on stuff. So break out of the genre, you know go beyond nature, look at travel, look at geography, look at history, all that sort of stuff. All relevant at the end of the day, isn't it? So yeah. 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 Oh, thank you for that. Um, I had a question here. Um, Kia, did you want to ask the questions you sent or would you like me to ask them? Sorry, he's just, I'll give him a moment. <laughs> whilst kids thinking I will um I had one question here was what or who do you think is your biggest inspiration in life oh wow uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I thought of a really good um I was asked this the other day and I thought of the answer after they after the call had ended <laughs> which was a shame and I can't remember it um <laughs> I think to be honest, I, I just think my parents um, and I know for, for lots of people, um, it's hard for them to relate to that, which I completely appreciate. Um, but I've been just really blessed to have amazing parents who um, I think just watching them overcome huge challenges in, in their lives, both separately and together. Um, and always with such grace and resilience and positivity, I think has um, just been really, really, I think it's just been a great teacher for me and my brother in how do you respond to hard things and difficulty. Um, and it's really nice because when you're kind of in your 20s and stuff if you've got if you're lucky enough to have a good relationship with your parents they kind of become your friends and you kind of enjoy hanging out with them as as adults and and you your relationship evolves to be slightly different and um yeah I think they're they're like cotton you know they're both in their 60s and still work full time and um you know never complain about anything even though there's many things they could complain about um, so I think it's just that that sort of attitude to life and they're both 
always so good at reveling in tiny things and tiny moments of like, oh my gosh, isn't that sunset just like amazing? Or did you see the stars or just, I don't know, just like little, little things like that. I just, I really like, cause they, they're very good at being in the moment, which is increasingly hard. Yeah, that's, that's really nice to hear. I think obviously in your twenties, it can be a really hit or miss kind of like relationship with your parents mm. so and that transition from being a child into adulthood and having your own life and stuff it can like you say go either really way hard. so yeah. yeah yeah it's hard um, oh that's really nice to hear um I, I haven't <laughs> heard from Keir so I will ask his questions for you um oh oh Francis yeah go for it Francis you can unmute yourself go for it <laughs> Hello. I feel like can I hey. my camera as well? <laughs> is that otherwise? Is that okay? Of course. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for your talk. I just. You're welcome. I'm 23 and I've just pretty much finished uni. Um, off the back of. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's been a been a while now. I graduated in summer. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm sort of in that realm of figuring out what to do and I did a sports science degree and my background is very sci like sporty and it's pretty much been in the last six six months that I've actually come into this space of the environment mm -hmm. and nature through volunteering at a nature mm -hmm. reserve and um my question because my because my background's really unrelated um, in terms of the education that I've had a lot of my friends when I say I've been volunteering at a nature reserve I often get sort of received with oh that's that's really cute or that's that's quite wholesome mm. um and so I was just wondering um how if you've received that as feedback or if you tailor your audience um, tailor your communication to your audience at all um, depending on how receptive they are um, to what you have to say around sort of nature and climate change? Yeah, um, that's a that's a really good question. Thanks, Francis. Um, and I, I'm sorry if like you feel that, I don't know, your friends are, because sometimes you, you know your friends are sort of, it's coming from a supportive place, but sometimes it can get a little bit grating after a while when you're like, well, actually, you know, it's not cute. It's, it's hard and it's really important and I'm into it. So it'd be nice if you sort of, I don't know, just we're a bit more less flippant with your aside. So I've definitely had that. I think the whole like, oh, it's so wholesome thing. I mean, I poke the I I sort of say that about myself all the time. Um, but I've I usually take quite a tongue-in-cheek approach to most things. Um, but I think in terms of tailoring communication, um, it's really trial and error and it's really hard to know who you're speaking to. Um, even with analytics and stuff that are available on social media. I think what social media is great at, and especially Instagram, is that it, it celebrates personality. And um, TikTok, I mean, has shown this in, 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 in spades where the kind of quirkier, the better. And I think you can sort of go a bit over the top there, but I think the main thing is authenticity. And there's nothing... I find that there's nothing more engaging than watching someone who is being really authentic as in being really true to themselves. And I think you've clearly evolved your path that perhaps wasn't the plan to go from sports science into nature, but it's really exciting. And I think if it's something that's really exciting for you, you kind of have to, while you're in that transition phase and you just kind of need to head down and focus and figure out, figure it out for yourself first, just kind of let those comments and stuff bounce off a little bit um, and just know that if you're excited about it and it's meaningful to you, that's all that matters at the moment. Everyone else can carry on doing their own thing. When you're in your 20s, it's all about everyone's kind of in it for themselves and everyone's also in the same boat, um, figuring stuff out, don't really know what they're doing, trying new things, ditching other things, gaining new friends, you know, it's all it's a whole period of change and so I think um just kind of keep going and don't let those things bother you and I think try not to worry too much about sort of changing how you're saying stuff or how you're relaying or communicating 
um, do what feels natural to you and trust that people will engage with it because it's coming from just you and you're not trying to be anyone else. You're not trying to say it in a different way. It's really hard to sometimes stay true to yourself and your voice when the world is so noisy and it's very easy to think, oh, well, they've got like a million likes on their post. Maybe I should do it a bit like them. There's a difference between being inspired and I think being influenced and then influence sometimes leads to you pressuring yourself to do stuff that you actually don't want to do um, or to say things in a way that feel really unnatural for you um, uh, because you're sort of feeling burdened with, oh, but people will like that if I do it like that. I don't know if this any of this is making any sense. I think the main thing is that just focus on what you want to do. And if you're enjoying it, that is honestly all that matters because it sounds amazing. And I think going from a sports science background is so cool. And it, of course, it is relevant because, you know, there's so many angles that you could take with that, whether it's from a physical and physical well-being of being outside and being in touch with the natural world and the science behind that. Um, I think if you're remotely interested in sport and the outdoors and adventure we have a natural responsibility to talk about nature uh, because we're natural custodians of it it's our playground it's it, we want it to be clean and safe and thriving um, so that other people can enjoy it alongside us so um, I think it's a really exciting blend of stuff but any comments like that from people, just let them bounce off and know that what you're doing is actually really important. And I think if they see that you're really thriving in that evolution of your of your expertise, then I bet they'll be more than inspired by it, whether they admit it or not. <laughs> no, thank you very much. It all comes from a good place. I know that they, they don't mean it in any. Yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. But I think when you're, you know, whenever you're changing your tack, on various things it's quite a vulnerable place to be in um and so you know just be kind to yourself and I think just you know enjoy every moment and take every opportunity because every opportunity is going to be valuable whether it's in that very moment or a couple of years down the line and you think oh actually that was quite handy that I did that even if at the time you hated it <laughs> no thank you you're welcome thanks for the question regardless of you know, their background they can everyone will have come across situations where maybe people won't quite understand your love of nature or things like that so thank you for that and it will take their own time as well to do that everyone's on their, a different time scale and so if, if it if it doesn't quite click with your friends when it clicks for you then maybe just wait and trust that it will maybe later Mm -hmm. um, how do you think we can make humans closer to nature Ooh, what an excellent <laughs> question oh well it depends um if you're thinking like well it's like a mental and a physical answer to this right so um okay let's go oh well you can watch it on youtube <laughs> Um, I mean, to be physically closer to nature, you just need to get out into it, whether that's in your local park or, um, I don't know, traveling to the coast or just going somewhere where there's some green space. There's so many scientific studies that just show how being near green or blue um, in nature can just do wonderful things to your mental well-being and also your physical well-being with calming hormones and reducing fight or flight and all of that sort of stuff and clearing your mind um and I think once people repetitively experience those feelings it then becomes something that they actively seek over a long period of time and something that they would prioritize incorporating into like a daily routine or a weekly routine um and so the more accessibility we can promote into those spaces and the more um yeah increasing access to nature is just it's a fundamental part of um how this country needs to be shifting its priorities but i think it's the physical 
presence of it around you you know can you touch a leaf can you feel the ground beneath your feet can you engage in all the senses can you smell um the the flowers can you hear the bird song can you hear waves lapping on the shore all those sorts of things are so stimulating and it's all about building that personal connection and relationship with nature and it's how do we build that long lasting relationship so it's not just a once you know once a month once a year thing it's something that is like a, a daily fix that you really crave um and so i think it's just promoting the very manageable incorporations of nature into your daily life will help people see it as a, an achievable thing and then also you know planting wildflowers sowing pot plants um looking after things like herbs on the windowsill just those little humans naturally are very nurturing and so I think allowing ourselves the opportunity to see if something grows in a pot if I water it and put it on the windowsill and following that journey um is a good way to to connect them to nature so um yeah it's kind of how long is a piece of string it can range from looking after a basil plant on your windowsill to going for a wild swim or going for a bike ride in a new place or working on a nature reserve and helping to maintain um maintain habitat is uh, is a really cool thing as well i can definitely relate from the, the plant side of things all of the windowsills in my Absolutely. house so yeah covered. maria is showcasing <laughs> a, a, a great example and then i think again it's it's sharing those experiences so if you found something that is exciting for you talk about it tell your friends about it be an evangelist tell people how fun it was or, or how you sort of revived a coriander on, on the windows <laughs> I'm not speaking from personal experience at all <laughs> oh. I think you'll find that the world is very much split into coriander lovers and coriander haters There's no oh my gosh me. such a lover I love <laughs> 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 little side side note there. Um, <laughs> I, I think a question that we always ask um, mm. and I'll let you have two answers to this question um, so favourite bird one Ooh. just found in the UK one can be global if you have Ooh. a weird and wacky one that you need to get in there <laughs> okay uh, oh just in the UK tricky because a lot of the birds in the UK the UK is very special and it has lots and lots of visitors and some of them have kind of become a bit native and the habitat in the UK has become hospitable enough that they don't need to migrate silly distances but I'll let you have one if they occur in the I'll, I'll let you have have migrating to the UK one birds as well then okay <laughs> thank you um ooh, it changes all the time if I'm honest um I have a real soft spot for it's a love hate relationship. And this is a bird in chapter nine of the book. And it's the Merlin, which is native to the UK. It's the smallest falcon. I, I, I may or may not have seen it. I will not give that away. But I loved it because it's just a bird that's been so grossly overlooked by science and by the public. And yet we've got this fascinating history with it in terms of hawking and um it the merlin being tiny it's like the size of a blackbird but oh my gosh it's fierce and ferocious and it has this amazing like feisty personality um and bright yellow legs which i thought were very fancy um it was mary queen of scots favorite bird to hawk and i just thought that was the most incredible image of mary queen of scots as a fierce kind of feisty scotswoman hawking the merlin um and they're such an icon of British uplands and yet their future is really uncertain and they've had a really really rocky ride to to all sorts of things like being hammered by pesticides and dwindling food chains and um and things like that so there's a, there's a lot that we can learn from the Merlin but they just are a bird that shows its size doesn't matter they will quite happily mob um a buzzard or a golden eagle or any bird really it could be 10 times the size and the merlin won't care um so i think it, it has quite a good attitude to life in in many ways so i do like the merlin and in terms of a bird that can be found overseas but it's also found in the uk um 
I think I'm right in saying in that the British Isles has is home to the stronghold of gannets in Europe, but the gannet is Europe's largest seabird. Um, and the gannet, the first time I saw a gannet, I was walking around the coast path in Cornwall on my own, and I could not, I, I could not get over how big it was, and um, they're they're just enormous, and the the way that they are adapted to hunt and and slam the water up to 60 miles an hour with no damage to their bodies with this immense impact is amazing and um it's been really devastating to see them hammered by bird flu uh and to just see this icon of a bird that is so evolved and so ancient in many ways as well it's almost like a um uh is it a pterodactyl it looks very dinosaur-y anyway um but yeah just this bird that has spent millions of years to be utterly in tune with its environment and its way of life um so yeah gannet and merlin are great <laughs> that was really insightful i think that question always gives you a little <laughs> window into people's brains of like how what sort of thing they cherish most or how you know yeah. what, what things they look for character wise so yeah, yeah that's, that's true. That really interesting yeah oh, <laughs> maybe oh maybe think about that now <laughs> yeah I know and I'm like oh, what's what's wrong what insight is that giving everyone to my brain apologies <laughs> Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophie, for this evening. We're oh, at one pleasure. minute to eight. Already the time has flown by. Oh gosh, I, I'm yeah. sure everyone has really enjoyed themselves and everyone will get so much you know, out of this talk. Everyone will find something that's relevant to them and they can apply that to their lives. So thank you so much for um, coming and talking to us today. Oh, um, thank you we've for got... having me. Oh no, you're very welcome. We're we're honoured to have you here. <laughs> um, oh, we've got a little good. slide of your book on here. Ah. That was interested, so you know what to look for if you haven't read it or not. It's a it's a, an amazing read. So we definitely recommend people. It's also go ahead available and... in libraries as well, which yes. people always forget. Don't don't forget about your local library. Also, for anyone who lives um, in or around London, um, there is a guided bird walk coming up this weekend run by our youth, youth team. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, please um, pop That's onto great. the website and have a look. That would be great. Um, and then also the um, deadline for our bird camps, for applying for the bird camps for this year, is coming up um, this weekend, I believe. So um, please do get your applications in if you would like to go to one of those. Um, and then we do have our equipment donation scheme that's always running. Um, if you want to donate any spare equipment you might have, or if you feel like you um, would benefit from some equipment and can apply to get it yourself or for a group you're part of or for a school or anything like that. Um, so don't forget about those, those um, opportunities there. And yes, so thank you again to Sophie and thank you for everyone for coming tonight. Um, thank you. Yeah.